Good evening, uh, everyone. Welcome to the World Art Center tonight uh, for the discussion by Maloon uh, Katari on the realization of human rights in India. We're very lucky to have Maloon here in Vancouver for the, the fourth uh, time. Maloon gave a talk on Monday night on the right to adequate housing. He previously, in 2007, uh, did a country report on Canada, and as he's been going around uh, doing various meetings with uh, the city and civil society organizations, uh, he revealed to me that despite the fact that it's, it's his fourth uh, trip to Vancouver, he has yet to be able to get to Stanley Park because the schedule is so full. So he's got one more day uh, after this. Uh, we're uh, SFU's Van City Office of Community Engagement is uh, very happy to be partnering with SFU Public Square and also the Indian Summer Festival, which has been happening se the second year in a row uh, in partnership uh, with SFU. Uh, before I introduce the, the moderator, I wanted to invite Sarish Rao, the Artistic Director of Indian Summer, to tell us uh, about the upcoming events uh, that, are, that are still going to be happening. Welcome, Sarish. Hi, everyone. Um, Welcome, warm welcome. Thanks to uh, thanks for making it out here, um, surviving the cyclists. I mean, I'm a cyclist myself. I love cyclists, but cyclists are the truckers of the pedestrian world for sure. <laughs> and they're just like whizzing. My no, no, it's true. It's true because uh, just the other day we had um, Sharmila Tagore, the queen of Bollywood, this very elegant, refined uh, woman who'd, who's been in f uh, cinema for 50 years, and uh, we were walking down the seawall, and a cyclist gave her the finger, and then, <laughs> like, it was one of those moments when you're like, um, I think he was waving to you, and she's like, oh, how sweet, how sweet. <laughs> so, anyway, I'm not here to talk about cyclists. I, I tend to digress, but um, really, all I want to say is that I'm uh, we're very proud to have Malone here, uh, and, and thanks to ARM and the Van City Office of Community Engagement for making this possible. And this kind of starts off for us at Indian Summer, the second phase of our festival. Um, Indian Summer is very clearly a festival of arts and ideas, and the ideas part, I think, for us is key um, to really try and find a place in Vancouver for a global dialogue. And we feel more and more that what happens in different parts of the world affects people everywhere, and we need to be part of a dialogue that is inclusive and global. And uh, so, so pleased to have you here, Maloon, to kick this off. I just wanted to tell you about a couple of events coming up um, tomorrow. That's the Thursday at 7 p.m. We have MJ Akbar, who is a fascinating journalist, thinker, writer. And um, he's spent a lot of time thinking about Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Islam Christian conflict. So, which brings us to this huge topic, uh, why is Osama bin Laden hiding in Pakistan, uh, what's the uh, repercussions of nuclear armament, so on and so forth. He's a fascinating speaker. On Friday, we have um, a concert of Sufi music, which again um, goes through these, you know, falls between and outside the lines of religion and, cult and several cultures. And then on Saturday, we have the great feminist writer, thinker, and publisher, Urvashi Butalia, who founded Kali for Women. And she'll be speaking about partition, about uh, the women's movement in India, and her work in general. So they're all coming up. And tonight, uh, I thank you once again, Milun, for being here. And please stay longer next time in Vancouver. And thanks to you all for coming. Uh, thank you, Suresh. I also wanted to uh, acknowledge that we're on the traditional territories of the Coast Salish people. Uh, we're also very lucky uh, this evening uh, to have Charlie Smith moderating the discussion and the Q&A this evening. Most of you probably know uh, Charlie Smith from the Georgia Strait. Uh, he, prior to becoming the editor, he was the news editor of the Georgia Strait for more than a decade. And from 98 to 2005, he taught investigative journalism at Kotlin University College. We focused a great deal of attention on reporting in a multicultural society. In addition, uh, Charlie has worked as an associate producer at CBC Radio and researched and reported stories on uh, CBC TV. I ask you to join me in welcoming Charlie Smith. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. And I just wanted to say, if this is your first Indian Summer Festival, festival event, 
I would encourage you to attend more because I, I took in several of them last year in the debut year, and it was absolutely fantastic. And I went to the Sharmila Tagore event as well out in Surrey, and it was, as, uh, as um, Suresh was saying, she was elegant and charming and very intelligent. And we're uh, fortunate tonight to have someone, I would use the same description, uh, Maloon Kathari. Uh, he's the... Um, convener of the working group on human rights in India, or on India and the UN, I'm sorry, Maloon, and uh, he was the UN Special Rapporteur on Adequate Housing from 2000 to 2008, and he wrote a report on Canada, which I was reading this week, which was very impressive and uh, informative. Um, in India these days, as people who are paying attention, there are a lot of um, human rights issues uh, ranging from, uh, you know, the Gujarat riots in 2002, the Naxalite rebellion that's taking place in many states across India and how it's being dealt with, um, extrajudicial killings, the fallout from the 2016-11 attacks in Mumbai on the Taj Hotel and the Oberoi Hotel. Um, so Maloon has been tracking kind of how the government's been responding, and I'm very interested to hear what he has to say. So he will be speaking for half an hour, 45 minutes, and then I will sit down and ask him a couple of questions, and then we'll take questions from the audience. And then afterward, there's going to be um, at uh, W2, there's going to be a social media event um, where the discussion will continue. So uh, we'll know... Further ado, I'll introduce Maloon Katari. Uh, thanks very much for that introduction, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, let me first begin by um, uh, welcoming the fact that uh, the India Summer Festival um, was uh, ready to uh, allow me to speak. Uh, festivals are not usually the places where um, you get a critical viewpoint. It's usually a celebration of the country's uh, culture and arts and all that. And it's wonderful that there is this space available uh, for me and for M.J. Akbar and for Urvashi um, to... Uh, give you perhaps another side of the country. Um, there's much to celebrate in India, but there's increasingly uh, much to condemn. And uh, I'll, I'll um, speak uh, about that, uh, but also looking ahead to uh, how we can change uh, the very, very dire and drastic uh, situation regarding a uh, range of human rights uh, in India. Um, so I work with... Uh, uh, Charlie was saying, the Working Group on Human Rights in India and the UN. This is an umbrella organization of uh, 15 of the main human rights groups working across India and a number of independent uh, experts um, working on human rights. Uh, we came together about four years ago. Uh, the purpose of uh, forming such an or uh, umbrella organization was to hold uh, the Indian government accountable uh, to its uh, national and international human rights obligations. Um, and so we've been very active in, uh, in pursuing that, uh, particularly uh, with the United Nations. Um, and that's the second context of this talk uh, this evening. Um, the United Nations Human Rights Council uh, four years ago initiated a, a new mechanism seeking accountability of states called the Universal Periodic Review. Uh, this is a peer review process where every member of the UN um, monitors and uh, um, reflects upon and gives recommendations to, uh, to their fellow members. Uh, and um, uh, Canada, of course, came up before this review uh, in 2009 and will be coming up again in, uh, next year. But this year, just a, a couple of months ago, uh, India underwent this universal periodic review. And what was striking was that um, in, in sharp contrast to the report that the Indian government presented to the UN, a range of reports, civil society reports, uh, reports from independent institutions, reports from our national 
Human Rights uh, Commission painted a very, very bleak uh, picture of human rights in India. And almost uh, unequivocally, all of them said that, uh, that the situation is worsening. So what I'm trying to, uh, going to try to do this evening is, uh, um, I mean, the lecture, the, the, the talk will be in uh, two parts. One is I'll give you an overview of the state of human rights uh, in the country, and then um, some thoughts on how uh, we, you know, we feel as a group uh, we can overcome the crisis. Um, and uh, uh, those of you who are interested more in this issue and who want to know more, uh, there's much more uh, than, you know, much more detail than what I can do in one, uh, in one talk. And there's a, a large report that has come out this year called Human Rights in India um, Status Report, which is on uh, wghr.org. And uh, those of you who are more interested in the work of this working group, uh, please come up to me afterwards, uh, and I can explain to you more. Um, so let me begin with the sort of hard reality of uh, civil and political rights uh, in India. Uh, we have a situation where, of course, due to historical reasons, Parts of India, um, including the Northeast and uh, Jammu and Kashmir, uh, have witnessed insurgency for many years. Um, the response of the government has been increased militarization. And uh, despite, despite a clear decrease in the insurgency in these areas, uh, the state response has remained mainly militaristic uh, and uh, accompanied by draconian security laws that have led to uh, widespread human rights violations. Uh, in these areas, uh, but not only in these areas, also in, in central India where there's um, a growing insurgency in uh, states of Chhattisgarh, Andhra Pradesh, Jharkhand, Orissa, West Bengal, uh, there's, there's a range of laws that provide extensive powers of arrest, detention without trial, and power to shoot, to kill on suspicion. Uh, and this militaristic approach um, is very widespread, but it, it, uh, it contradicts the government of India's consistent position at the UN and in other international forums that India does not face either international or non-international armed conflict. They don't consider this armed conflict, which is uh, very odd. One of the most draconian legislations, uh, some of you may have heard of it, is, is AFSPA. It's the Armed Forces Special Powers Act which provides sweeping powers and immunity um, to the armed forces uh, and was imposed almost half a century ago. Um, fundamental rights, such as the right to life, the right to a fair trial, right to remedy and reparation, the right against torture, are, are systematically violated uh, in, in areas where this law um, exists. And notwithstanding strong criticisms from a number of Indian institutions, civil society, of course, and, and a number of UN bodies, including uh, most recently the Universal Review at the Human Rights Council, uh, the, the, the legislation continues. Uh, there are no attempts being made to either amend it or to repeal the legislation. The other area which is of great concern is custodial torture and violence. Uh, they remain entrenched and routine. Uh, and and uh, and routine law enforcement and investigative practices across India. Um, and, and uh, of course, the, the practice of power is even more widespread um, and condoned in conflict areas. Most torture cases in India go unreported um, and because victims fear uh, reprisals. And uh, even though India has ratified uh, almost all the international human rights instruments, they haven't ratified the um, Convention Against Torture. And uh, this was one of the main recommendations that came out of the uh, Universal Periodic Review. Uh, the reason they give is that we don't have a national law against torture. Uh, what, there is a law that has been drafted, and it's currently uh, before a parliamentary stand select committee. Uh, but it has been blocked from further progress for the last few years. The third area of concern um, is uh, our enforced disappearances um, and extrajudicial killings. Uh, these remain widespread in conflict areas, uh, as I mentioned, reinforced by extraordinary powers of arrest, detention, and immunity available to the security forces. Um, and India has not 
I mean, this is one other instrument. They haven't ratified the UN Convention for the Protection of All Persons from Enforced uh, Disappearances. Um, the National Crime Bureau um, report uh, 2010 uh, reveals uh, much higher incidences of police firing and resultant civilian uh, casualties and injuries in all conflict zones. And the, the data, however, doesn't um, reflect the actual number of extrajudicial executions. Uh, earlier this year, the UN Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial and Summary Executions uh, visited India, and one of his remarks in preliminary observations at the end of his mission was that um, was the uh, the sort of criticism he made of this notion of fake encounters. This is very common in India, and he said, when this occurs, suspected criminals or those labeled as terrorists or insurgents are shot dead by the police and a scene of a shootout is staged. Those killed are then portrayed as the aggressors who had first opened fire, and the police escape legal sanction. Uh, so this remains a, a, a major problem. The f phenomenon of fake encounters uh, continues. Um, so in, in the, uh, uh, there are, I mean, I, I can go on, there's a number of other sort of very serious and very depressing issues around uh, civil and political rights, but um, one of the impacts which is, um, which has, uh, which, which is a result of this, uh, is the, um, the, the violence uh, faced by a number of groups in India. Uh, the violence particularly faced uh, by women. Uh, and uh, um, while we have a number of uh, violence, generally violence against women is, um, uh, is targeted and atrocities committed um, include a you know, range of issues. There are particular groups of women who are affected more. Dalit women are um, very uh, sort of disproportionately high in this, uh, you know, when, you, when we look at who is targeted by, by violence. Um, and we do have a number of laws. We have a, a Domestic Violence Act, which is actually quite progressive, but is hampered in its implementation by uh, lack of resources. Um, the other factor that works against women in India uh, is discrimination. I mean, discrimination is systemic in the country, it's embedded in socio-cultural norms and laws uh, that structure uh, family, community, workplace, and uh, state policies. And family laws are um, codified uh, with reference to religion, religion and custom rather than rights given in our uh, constitution. Uh, so uh, there, there's a range of, uh, you know, there's much work that needs to be done uh, in, in this area including reform of uh, family laws and laws that govern um, succession and inheritance uh, of property. Um, the, the, uh, and there are you know, a number of other groups. Uh, I, I wanted to particularly point out the situation of children in India. The um, situation is, uh, is very, very, uh, very, very serious. Um, crimes against children um, have shown 120% increase uh, in a 10-year period between 1999 and 2009, and a 60% increase just in the, um, if you go from now, the last five years. Um, we don't have comprehensive laws on child trafficking. Um, there's a whole case of disappearances. Um, uh, the government of India actually states publicly that in any given year, an average of about 44,000 children are reported missing, out of which uh, 11,000 remain untraced. Uh, and all of you will have heard of um, uh, the, the persistence of child labor in India. India has the highest number of child laborers uh, in the world. A uh, majority of child laborers are Dalits, um, with many surviving on less than a dollar a day. And uh, we, we are, uh, the, there's a huge confusion about what uh, what should be done uh, for, for children. Um, the other group that is very, very uh, sever severely affected, although there's been significant progress in recent years, are the sexual caste uh, and the sexual tribe. So, um, you know, this has been historically, there have been targets of acute uh, discrimination. 
We have a very strong act called the Scheduled uh, Castes and Scheduled Tribe Prevention of Atrocities Act, which has been recently amended, so there's a higher compensation for crimes that are committed, but the crimes um, continue, and um, uh, it, it's, uh, th this issue has been continuously also brought up at the UN, but um, uh, the position of India has consistently been that um, this is an issue we want to handle uh, domestically. Uh, they say that uh, the United Nations, of course, refers to caste-based discrimination as a form of racial discrimination. And India continues to take a position that caste is not race. And uh, so there's this polemical kind of debate going on. Uh, we've been able to shift this now to uh, saying, look, if we just take the fundamental human rights principle of non-discrimination uh, in the realization of rights, then obviously from a non-discrimination viewpoint, um, uh, there's much that needs to be condemned about the treatment uh, of uh, Dalits, and there's much that can be done uh, using uh, non-discrimination uh, laws. The second area I wanted to talk about uh, our so is the socioeconomic situation. Um, it doesn't get any better here. If you look at statistics, um, it's very sobering. Around uh, 450 million people live below the poverty line um, in India. Uh, and there's a national poverty rate of 37%, and I'll, I'll come back to this. This, is a, this figure is very low. 50% uh, of the world's hungry live in India. 46% uh, of India's children are undernourished. Uh, this is the highest in the world, uh, shockingly double that of sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and our ma maternal mortality rate is amongst the highest in the world. Um, according to an independent uh, committee uh, appointed by the government of India um, to study employment uh, in the informal sector, about 77 percent, um, it's about 850 million people in India, uh, subsist on uh, uh, 20 rupees a day, which is about 40 cents a day. Um, and 93% of the working population is in for, uh, employed in the informal sector, so they have no protection of labor rights, safety issues. Um, about 130 million people are landless, and uh, these families don't, do not have land uh, for their um, housing, habitation, and land reform measures have not been successfully uh, implemented. And a large percentage of India's population uh, lives in inadequate housing. Um, and, and there's a huge problem of access to water and sanitation. What makes this, and, and um, this sort of overall alarming uh, situation um, and these alarming socioeconomic indicators actually point to um, two tragic contradictions which I can say lie at the heart of India's tries with democracy. I think this is, uh, and if these issues are not resolved, uh, it's difficult to imagine India continuing um, as a democracy as it is now. Um, one of the issues is, is, uh, is poverty. Um, poverty persists in India partly, uh, and some say largely because uh, our economic policies um, much like you have here, are driven by a neoliberal economic paradigm that perpetuates exclusion and, in fact, violates uh, fundamental rights and uh, directive principles that we have in our, um, in our constitution. Um, according to official figures, um, the average growth rate between 2007 and 2011 in India was 8%. But poverty, this is the official figure, only declined by 0.8%. Um, and what is very disturbing are the standards used to measure poverty. The standards are very suspect. They are uh, based on a poverty level of um, 50 cents a day, which is an absolute insult uh, to the poor. And um, also they are, um, these poverty statistics are, uh, even if you take those, it shows um, a significant number of people, um, you know, are, are, are poor. But um, the the statistics are, are very controversial there because they're based purely on uh, on on income. And it's actually striking that given all the experience we've had around the world, 
that uh, in India we, we no longer, uh, that, that um, we measure poverty just by, um, you know, if we, essentially what's striking is that when we talk about human progress across the world, we don't use um, the income as the only criteria. So it's striking, why do we then uh, still use income as a measure of poverty? If we use the human rights approach and looked at, um, and this is something that's been done in a recent um, poverty index, inequality index uh, developed uh, uh, by the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative and used by the United Nations Development Program in its Human Development Report of 2011, what they did is they looked at issues like years of schooling, child enrollment, mortality, uh, nutrition, electricity, sanitation, uh, drinking water, cooking, fuel, uh, asset ownership. And if you take these indicators into consideration, then 55% uh, of India's population, 55% um, uh, are poor. Um, and, and of course, it's clear when you take that kind of a, a assessment that uh, many poor people face uh, multiple deprivations um, and, and you know, even if they have reached a, a level of minimal income uh, poverty line, um, they are not considered extremely poor by that uh, yardstick. So there's a, there's a real need to uh, move away from that by the policymakers in India and take a much more holistic view of, uh, of poverty. And unless we are able to really uh, understand the scale of the situation, uh, how can we take the corrective measures that are necessary at the policy and legislative and administrative level? The second uh, contradiction that I wanted to briefly speak about is the issue of displacement. Um, according to one estimate, between 60 and 65 million people are estimated to have been displaced in India since uh, independence. Um, and the highest number of those displaced internally are because of development projects, large dams, uh, mineral extraction, a range of infrastructure projects. Um, and, and if you break this down, this amounts to around one million people displaced every year since independence. Um, and, and again, disproportionately of all of these, 46% um, are, are tribals, are indigenous, and 40% um, are, are, are Dalits. Um, and uh, because of this large-scale displacement, of course, we've had rapid urbanization. But many of the, of the people who get displaced from the rural areas are forced to come into the cities, face multiple displacements because they come into the city um, and they are, they are forced to live in, in slums or on the streets. Uh, they're considered illegal and their homes are uh, routinely uh, demolished. And it's interesting when you look at the international perspective of, for example, the rights that refugees have. Uh, refugees actually have more rights than people who are displaced uh, by development projects in India. So you displace and you come into the city, you have nowhere to go, no, no one to, to, to help you um, with your life. So displacement uh, continues to be a, a major problem and of, of all the people displaced, a uh, you know, number of studies have shown that uh, only about 20 to 25 percent uh, receive resettlement and rehabilitation. The rest are just left to their own uh, devices. Um, so there, there's, uh, and of course, this partly contributes to, contributes to the, um, you know, national uh, housing crisis that we have with about 26 million uh, sh units shortage in the country, and almost 99 percent of that is is uh, for economically uh, weaker sections. Uh, and yet there are no comprehensive human rights policies. Uh, there is currently a, a draft uh, before parliament of a land acquisition and rehabilitation and resettlement bill, but it's not, it's not a rights-based uh, legislation. And there's much work going on, particularly from civil society, to, to amend that uh, draft before it goes on the floor of the parliament. Uh, the other area in, you know, in terms of these economic, social, and cultural rights is the right to food. I think many of you will have heard about the food situation in India. We have an enormous food entitlement program. 
food subsidy schemes, public distribution schemes, um, and yet, in spite of uh, something like 40 uh, orders from the Indian Supreme Court, 21% um, of uh, the population remains uh, undernourished. And, um, and we've witnessed since, uh, in the last 10 years, uh, an alarming number of farmer suicides, which you will have heard about, um, and, uh, and hunger amongst, this is an ironic thing, that hunger amongst food the producers of food uh, is a reality in the country um, that ranks number two in the world in terms of farm production. So there's something horribly wrong. And we have uh, oversupply of grains, and yet uh, much of the grain uh, rots away because the distribution system is, um, is very poor, very flawed, and there's a lot of corruption in that as well. Uh, we have a national food security bill. Um, which is just going through its final stages. It's a very important step, but one of the shortcomings is that it fails to universalize public distribution system. The idea in the food security bill is you target groups that are uh, the most hungry, so it's received a, a, a lot of uh, criticism on, on, on that ground. Uh, I can go on about the right to health, the right to education, livelihood. Um, we have a shockingly low uh, for example, we only spend about 4% of our national budget uh, on health, um, which is far, far below the global median of around 11%. And um, health uh, remains a, a major, uh, major problem. Um, there's growing privatization of healthcare, um, and uh, and until very recently, uh, there was essentially um, no attempt made to establish what is called uh, in, in World Trade Organization language compulsory licen licensing, making generic medicines available. But this has recently been done. There's been a radical step taken by the government to allow Indian companies to um, produce the same drugs. Um, and in fact, just recently, a few weeks ago, the government announced that there would be universal health care in India and that medicines would be free uh, for those that cannot, that certain medicines will be free for everyone, so that's, uh, that's uh, positive. Um, one of the groups, I, I mean, I, this kind of a crisis of housing and health, uh, food, affects uh, you know, many, many people across the country, but one of the groups I wanted to particularly mention are human rights defenders. Um, one of the striking things in India today is that people who are defending uh, rights uh, are being increasingly targeted, um, there's, you know, uh, counter security legislation used against them, all sorts of harassment is there, uh, including for people who are defending using what is what I consider one of the most progressive uh, right to information acts in the world. We have a remarkable act which actually allows us to get just about any information from any government department, including file notings and, and so on. Uh, but the, the people who are using this act um, are often targeted. And most of them are not um, what we would consider traditionally human rights uh, activists. They're ordinary people who want to know uh, what is happening. And, and yet they're, um, uh, they are, uh, you know, they're arrested, harassed. Uh, some are killed every year. And uh, earlier this year, um, uh, we had, uh, last year actually, we had the visit of uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders, uh, Margaret Sekagea, and uh, she actually made a very interesting list of, uh, she traveled around the country, took testimonies from human rights defenders, and um, she found defenders were working on a, who were being you know, threatened, defending, uh, working on a range of issues, including those denouncing development projects, uh, those fighting for land rights, defenders working for uh, on the issues of religious minorities, sexual minorities, um, defenders working on women and child rights, uh, defenders seeking accountability for, you know, the large-scale um, uh, ethnic riots, communal pogroms that we've had in the country, uh, defenders upholding, upholding the rights of political prisoners, a range of other um, uh, defenders. And uh, so pervasive uh, human rights violations compounded by the non-accountability of state um, actors and institutions have um, triggered the emergence of new um, groups of defenders. 
as I mentioned, made up of ordinary citizens and grassroots communities fighting for their rights, but um, they are uh, being targeted. And uh, so, you know, the situation is, becomes very difficult for people who are uh, defending rights. So faced with... Um, Faced with such a situation, um, sort of a, what appears a very bleak situation, what, what is it that we can do? Um, uh, so what I'm going to try to uh, uh, sort of just just uh, formulate. Uh, I mean, uh, what 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 would be the contours of uh, of uh, such a such a change. Um, it's very clear that um, to meet uh, India has to meet the uh, human rights accountability challenge posed uh, by its own constitution, which continues to be uh, uh, violated, and by the international instruments it has ratified. But to meet this enormous challenge, it's very clear that nothing but a radical shift uh, in economic security and social policy uh, is needed. Uh, it's, it's, the change is not going to come from piecemeal uh, approaches, the change is not going to come from one law here, one policy there, but uh, a, a radical rethinking is necessary. And I don't consider that to be uh, a very sort of unachievable idea, because uh, in spite of everything, India um, continues to remain a, a vibrant democracy. Uh, we have some remarkable independent institutions in the country, uh, the Controller, Auditor General, the Election Commission, who are fiercely independent. Uh, now the, Nas uh, the National Human Rights uh, uh, Commission. And um, we have a, a, you know, a many other strengths, which, I, which I'll just come to. Uh, one of the um, sort of direct challenges for the government uh, would be to implement uh, court orders, orders from the high courts, orders from the Supreme Court to implement uh, UN recommendations. If you look just at the recent uh, Universal Periodic Review, uh, the UN Human Rights Council recommend uh, in that document that has come out, which still is being discussed, um, but the preliminary document uh, recommends that India, you know, ratifies the instruments against torture and uh, and for disappearances, that there are in comprehensive reforms to address sexual violence and all acts of violence against women, improve um, training of police officers who are you know, often uh, the uh, oppressors, uh, consider abolishing the death penalty. We still have the death penalty uh, in India. Uh, ban all forms of uh, child labor, strengthen efforts towards addressing uh, maternal and child mort mortality, strengthen efforts to combat trafficking, and uh, address the inequities based on the uh, rural and urban uh, divide. So there are many recommendations um, that need to be taken forward. And in fact, one positive aspect of the Universal Periodic Review is that India actually has to go back to the council, just as Canada now has to do for next year. India has to go back in four years and, and report progress, so it gives civil society in particular a good handle to uh, hold the government accountable. The second area which we have been as a working group discussing um, quite regularly with um, our, our foreign ministry and our home ministry uh, is that we need to see a change in the way in which India approaches uh, the international community uh, and the UN. We need to see a change from the current very defensive position uh, and the current sort of routine answers that India gives whenever problems are raised is, oh, but we have this policy, we have this law, uh, you know, uh, to move from that to be a more, a more strident approach. And there are some signs of this. Uh, just recently this year, uh, you know, for the first time in history, India um, actually voted uh, for a resolution uh, which pointed out at the Human Rights Council, which pointed out the serious human rights violations that have taken place in Sri Lanka. Uh, and and uh, this was a, a major step forward because um, it's it sort of consistent with uh, uh, India's democratic values that are grounded in, in justice and accountability. And India has been, has offered an open invitation 
to UN rapporteurs. They're, they're uh, accepting rapporteurs uh, with almost uh, any, any mandate. And there is a shift in our foreign policy, which is, which is very welcome. Uh, part of it is a result of, uh, of course, uh, a lot of civil society work, but also because we have aspirations to become a member of the Security Council. Uh, we have aspirations to be counted uh, amongst as one of the big boys at the international level to sit at all the tables. Uh, but also there is a recognition that we cannot continue uh, to be a global player or to have global aspirations if we do not improve uh, our human rights situation. Because unlike in China, uh, in India you cannot hide anything. Um, there's a you know tremendous amount of scrutiny by civil society. It's a democratic country, so uh, you can get information if you want. Um, this, the, the other area that um, there needs to be a change is that the government needs to acknowledge and work with civil society. Um, India has some uh, absolutely amazing civil society groups, national campaigns that are working on the right to food on child labor, on the rights of construction workers, the right to information campaign, uh, the work on housing, uh, the work, uh, the campaign on, uh, uh, you know, on, on uh, discrimination against Dalits uh, and so on. And uh, there's, there's a need to be much more open to these campaigns, to have much more uh, constructive engagement and to accept the recommendations that are coming from these campaigns. And some of the laws that I was mentioning, the Right to Information Act, for example, is a direct result of these campaigns, which actually started uh, at the grassroots level. Um, the other promising uh, aspect is that we have um, some very good human rights institutions. I mentioned the National Human Rights Commission. We also have a commission on sexual caste, which is doing some very progressive monitoring and other work. Uh, and, and we have commissions at the state level, um, which are not very effective and very ill-resourced, but, uh, but the institutional basis is there. Um, and finally, we have our youth. Um, it's quite remarkable in this era of uh, you know, materialism and uh, everything that we still find. I travel across the country. Uh, youth that are very active, that are out on the streets, that are organizing, that are speaking out against injustice that are coming from all parts of the country, including uh, villages and small towns. And, and uh, India is a very young country in that sense, demographically, and so it's quite promising if this you know, becomes a sort of a, a, a groundswell. Um, so that's, um, I ju I'm just you know, throwing out these ideas. I think there are many more uh, positives that uh, we can think about. and. Uh, and uh, we, we are all um, engaged. Uh, we are at least able to speak to our government, which is not possible in many countries. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm optimistic that uh, the work that is being done at the UN by civil society, by independent institutions, um, will, uh, and, and the recognition by the government that there needs to be a radical change, uh, will lead to a more positive future for the millions in India whose rights continue to be violated. Thank you very much. Now, I was taping what Maloon had to say so I can uh, write a story on our website. <laughs> um, the, uh, and thanks for that presentation. I have lots of questions, um, but I'll, I'll give a chance for the audience to ask questions as well. Um, one of the first questions I have, Maloon, is you were talking about human rights defenders being targeted, and you're obviously a very high-profile human rights defender yourself, and I'm wondering whether you've faced any consequences as a result of speaking out about these issues. Yeah, they're probably monitoring what I'm doing here in Canada. But, uh, no. Um, well, yes, the, the work that we do is closely monitored. Uh, we know perhaps, you know, um, not sure, perhaps our phones are tapped. But, uh, but uh, I haven't directly, you know, received any threats. I think part of the reason is that uh, they usually don't go after people who have a, um, 
who have a profile. And one of the reasons why our working group has been successful to an extent is because the leadership of the human rights organization consists of people who have um, a lot of credibility, who are nationally known, uh, who can very quickly mobilize uh, the international community. Uh, and I think that might be a reason. Uh, but the other reason, of course, is that um, uh, I think it's like you have here in Canada, all, all the you know, ministries, government departments have um, uh, bureaucrats who are very sincere, who are actually on our side. And, and so we don't have a sort of governance system where the entire, uh, you know, block of uh, government officials would be saying, well, let's go after these people. Uh, but what I'm saying should not hide the fact that the thousands of human rights defenders who are, who don't have that kind of a reach, um, and particularly in the rural areas, because nobody even knows what happens to them, um, they are, you know, continuously being targeted, and and that's uh, that's a major concern which the rapporteur also tried to bring out. Among the diaspora, particularly here in in Greater Vancouver, is there's a great concern about Punjab and what happened in uh, 1984 in Delhi with the riots targeting uh, Sikhs and the. Um, claims that there hasn't been much accountability against, in some cases, Congress party leaders um, who may have played a role in that. And I'm wondering to what extent this is an issue in India and whether you foresee any chance of accountability taking place down the road. Um, well, the, the justice system is very slow um, in the country and, and many people use that to, you know, sort of delay accountability. Um, but there are still, you know, high-profile cases going on um, in in the high court in uh, in many parts of the country against people who are accused of either the Sikh riots in '84 or the Gujarat riots, uh, and mo and more recently the Kandamal, uh, the the riots against uh, the Christian community in Orissa. In uh, the, so so there are there are cases going on, but um, and and in some some situations. Uh, politicians have been, um, you know, con uh, convicted, uh, but it's it's. I mean, the process is very slow because in in almost all these cases, um, there were politicians who were involved, uh, and there was, uh, you know, even tacit or even direct um, involvement of uh, chief ministers um, of, of certain states. So, um, I mean, the the struggle continues, uh, but what is also disturbing about the uh, this ethnic riots that we've had um, is the fact that after you know many many years, if you look at uh, the situation, particularly in Gujarat, uh, people continue to live in camps. Uh, they're not they've not been able to go back to their homes because it's insecure for them to do that. Um, and, and so that sort of restitution process hasn't occurred, and uh, that's a major concern as well. One of the things I think people abroad have trouble comprehending is how Narendra Modi could be the chief minister of Gujarat after what happened and how he's managed to remain in power for so long. Um, what can you tell us about uh, why he's still there and what accounts for his political longevity in, in light of the human rights record? Well, there are many reasons. He's um, Part of the reason, I think a large part of the reason is that the government at the central level, um, you know, at least in the last 10 years, has not been secure. They've been mostly coalition governments. Uh, they don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to, you know, directly confront uh, the major opposition party to which uh, Narendra Modi belongs, uh, Bharatiya Janata Party. And uh, so, so there's been a reluctance uh, on, on their side uh, the other factor that has worked in favor of Narendra Modi um, is that he has he has embarked on a very rapid sort of industrialization process in Gujarat and uh, has gained a lot of support, uh, particularly from the diaspora, uh, who claim who you know who think he's a champion of India's development policy and he's he's someone his policies are something that you need to emulate across the country. Uh, but inside India, his uh, credibility is um, less and less every year. 
He's, uh, you know, there's still cases going on and people have testified against him. There's a lot of evidence that he was directly involved. And the party itself that he belongs to, at one point, they were even projecting him to be their prime ministerial candidate. But they no longer do that. Um, and, and they actually keep him You were away. choking before, maybe like George Bush. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so I think, I mean, I, I like to think his days are numbered. I, I don't know... Um, whether he'll ever be you know, convicted in court, but perhaps, uh, if not in India, hopefully at the international level. We have a very robust system in the international level now, and if evidence can be brought, um, I think there is sufficient evidence against him. One of the, the biggest issues in India these days is, is the Naxalite rebellion, or, or Maoist rebellion, as it's sometimes called, and taking place over several states, and and... Uh, last year at Indian Summer, Taran Tejpal was saying some uh, somewhat positive things about how the national government had moderated its um, response and was not being uh, as abusive in the, on the human rights side. And I'm wondering what your take is on that. Well, I, I, I'm surprised that Tarun said that. I, actually, the evidence is very much to the contrary because the government continues to employ, uh, you know, uh, paramilitary forces. In fact, there's a recent Supreme Court judgment which has called the government, uh, which said the government should disband uh, this one particular force, al um, and, and what is very striking uh, when you visit these areas, and, and actually insurgency is increasing, by the way. It's, um, uh, which states is it taking place in now? It's, uh, it's, it's you know, primarily Chhattisgarh, but also Andhra Pradesh, uh, West Bengal, um, and it, it's it's sort of spreading. Is it reaching Maharashtra on the west, or part of part of Maharashtra? Actually, that's one of the fears that it's going to you know spread into other states that have been free from insurgencies. But but what is very important to recognize is that the, I mean the the rationale that the Naxal groups, the Maoist groups, uh, always used was that uh, we are fighting for the tribals, for the indigenous people, and uh, because there has not been development in those areas. Uh, but then, you know, sort of they started using violent means, and, and the situation in a large part of these areas now is that the tribals are caught in between. They're caught in between the government forces and the, uh, and the Naxos and the Maoists. And that's, uh, and, and, and one aspect the government has acknowledged, uh, and this is something that our uh, rural development minister, Mr. Jairam Ramesh, has been actually quite um, radical in his statement, saying that, Yes, we have failed those areas since independence. There's been very little development. There's great poverty. And we need to do something about that. So instead of going in uh, with a military or a militaristic response or heavy police response, uh, perhaps the way to do it is to very rapidly bring in development in these areas. And some steps are being taken in that direction. I mean, what results it will show uh, is not yet clear. But at this moment, um, the insurgency is growing. One of the things is India is kind of in a rough neighborhood. If you look around, you've got, you know, you had civil war in Sri Lanka for, for a generation. You've got ongoing problems in Bangladesh. Yep. Uh, Nepal is not exactly uh, <laughs> stable and um, um, uh, democratic. And then uh, Pakistan is, uh, you could make the case it's a fa becoming a failed state. And Afghanistan is 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 in a mess too, and so given this reality, let's not forget China. Yeah, and then there's China, which is not exactly a human rights a paragon yeah. of human rights. So, and and you, you had Burma as well. So, so I'm just curious um, with Pakistan, particularly, and with with groups like LET uh, sending suicide bombers into India, um, and you were talking about the Convention Against Torture and why the India, India hasn't signed on to this. To what degree do you think India is refusing to sign the UN Convention Against Torture because it wants to, to have a free hand to deal with um, some of the problems that might be coming across the border? I, I don't think there's a link there because, the, the, as I mentioned, there's a very advanced draft of a national uh, act against torture which eventually will will be passed and and uh, it's a very it's quite a progressive act and I, I mean many of us feel it's quite consistent with the international instrument so 
you know, at some point in the next year or two, I expect that to be, uh, we will ratify the Convention Against Torture. But, but certainly the uh, very insecure geopolitical situation um, in the region, and, and, you know, when you take a comparative sort of relative perspective, India comes out looking yeah, it looks, Good, looks right? great in comparison. Uh, yeah. But that's small consolation to people yeah. who are undergoing the violations. Yeah. I mean, that's not... Um, and, and, of course, that's often used as an excuse to um, keep the, uh, you know, strong security legislation. And it's often used in, as an excuse to say that we need a strong army. Uh, that uh, one of the responses we get when we meet with uh, senior officials and say, well, this Armed Forces Special Powers Act makes no sense at all. Uh, one of the responses is, yes, it, it probably should be um, repealed or amended, um, as has been recommended by various UN bodies. But, but one of the responses is that we don't want to destabilize our army. At this stage when we are facing you know, so much mm -hmm. hostility from outside as well. And the particular concern is with the with our northern borders, uh, particularly with uh, with China. Yeah. Because China has been sort of, you know. I'll ask one more question, then I'll invite questions from the audience. Um, and this question concerns, you know, significant movement from rural to urban that's taking yes. place in India right now. And I'm wondering what the consequences are from a human rights perspective when you have migration of that magnitude to cities. Well, the consequences are quite severe. I mean, we see in our cities, some of our cities have uh, 40 to 50 percent of the populations uh, living in the slums. Um, as I mentioned, we have, you know, people being evicted uh, from their homes all the time. And, and one of the other consequences, which is really striking, and a lot of people are surprised, is that we have very debilitating levels of poverty in our cities which, you know, was not there before because people did find work and there was. But now we have pockets of poverty which are, you know, as bad or worse than we've had in rural areas, which is saying a lot. Uh, so that's, that's one of the consequences. There's been a, a slight shift uh, demographically in the sense that uh, migration, rapid migration to the mega cities uh, has actually come down. And a lot of the migration now is taking place to... Uh, what we call class two, three, and four, sort of medium and small towns. Can you give examples of what would, would Hyderabad be a class two or class one? Or? Uh, Hyderabad is class two. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, there, there are other cities like Patna and, you know, a yeah. range of other cities, uh, and uh, Merat, other cities. Uh, and, and, but the problem there is that these small and medium towns are, um, there's no planning. So they very quickly become a mess, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and and so they very quickly deteriorate. There's a lot of traffic pollution, um, slums come up everywhere, and uh, so that's the, there's certainly a, a, a consequence of that. Some of our programs, like the National Rural Urban uh, Guarantee Scheme uh, in our EGA, um, has slowed migration a bit because you know one of the main reasons for migration was lack of livelihood. Um, but there are a lot of problems with that act, and, and, and ironically, we don't have a similar, uh, you know, progressive government uh, program in the urban areas. So we don't have an employment guarantee scheme in the urban areas, which is quite striking. So does anyone have any questions? Uh, yes, this, this gentleman on the right. One is, oh, thank you. My question is about human rights. Many times people talk about human rights without talking about army rights. And they seem to be, like even in Canada and all over the world, army is getting much more resources and so on at the expense of social programs and so on. I think you might learn a lot about Canadian experience of the funds being diverted. So I was wondering whether you can talk about the rights of the army vis-a-vis -vis human rights, because the army is used to suppress the human rights. And my second question is about the role of culture, because India, Pakistan, all these countries are very good at promoting love and peace with the kawalis and dances and so on, uh, unlike the Hollywood, maybe. Uh, but yet, uh, 
it seems like that thing happens at night and violence stays in during the daytime. Is there any correlation between the culture part of peace and violence and hugging each other or dancing behind the trees and, and, and the army? Maybe the army can learn some of these songs and practice. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, the army is... Uh, uh, Bollywood likes the army. There are lots of films about the army. Uh, um, but um, I, I think when you speak about army rights, that's different from human rights we're talking about, right? You're not talking about the human rights of the army. You're talking about the sort of access that they have. And it's true, they have uh, a lot of resources. They're constantly buying, uh, you know, fighter jets and fancy armaments and so on. Um, and, and that's, but again, that goes back to the earlier question. Uh, the rationale for that is that we face a very difficult situation on our, uh, on our borders. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, but, but, you know, the evidence actually points to, uh, in, in, for example, uh, one very difficult thing to understand is, if I can go back to this Armed Forces Special Powers Act, is that even in areas of the country where insurgency has considerably reduced or completely disappeared, like, I'll give you one example, the state of Nagaland, the, the act continues to be in operation. So, so there's something, um, you know, that uh, there's something happening there which is, uh, and, 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 and the Ministry of Defense, uh, even if we can get other ministries like the Home Ministry and others, uh, and the Home Minister has in fact publicly uh, said there's, we need to do something about this act, um, the, the Ministry of Defense refuses to discuss it. Um, so, so there is a I mean, one good thing, if we can call it good, I don't know, is that in India, unlike in Pakistan and other countries, uh, the army has been, at least that was a, a major step taken after independence, that the army has been completely apolitical and, you know, doesn't get involved in any kind of what you hear about and see in other countries. Uh, so that's, you know, one, one positive aspect. Uh, but certainly the... the they, they have access to a lot of resources and they carry a, a lot of weight. And there is a certain, you know, they're constantly also pa playing up the patriotic part and saying, you know, we're protecting the country and we have to support our soldiers and so on. Um, your second question is more interesting. Um, I, I think that, of course, the role of culture is very important um, in India. We have an incredible diversity of... Uh, arts, crafts, uh, you know, film. Uh, in fact, Bollywood is only one. We have lots of other regional cinema. Some of it is very good. Um, and, uh, and, and, of course, you know, when you look at only, when you only see that, you, you get a totally distorted view of India. And, and, in fact, when you dig a little deeper, the, the very people that we celebrate, uh, whether it's, you know, craftspeople, whether it's, of people at the village level who, who are involved in theater, who are involved in uh, musicians, um, they're all very, uh, many are very poor. I mean, they don't get, even very famous uh, village musicians don't get the kind of financial and other support that uh, you would find is common in countries like Canada and elsewhere. Um, but the other interesting aspect about culture is that uh, the, the kind of resistance that is there in the country from you know, civil society movements from, uh, there's a lot of artistic expression. So, for example, we have a lot of street theater. Um, we have a lot of sort of work with youth on, you know, educating people about human rights violations. Uh, so so m many of the cultural um, sort of expressions that we have are also used as um, in, in forms of resistance, which is, which is a very powerful means of getting the message across. So, you know, culture has two sides. But one other aspect I would bring up is that very often um, people in India, um, like Sashi Tharoor and others, often speak about that India, is, uh, India should project its soft power. And by that, they mean... Canada talks that way sometimes, oh, really? but in, okay. the, in a previous time, okay. <laughs> before the current um, government. But... But, you know, I, I mean, and that means our culture, our civilization, our music, our whatever. Um, but, I mean, I, I wouldn't really subscribe to that because uh, just saying that um, 
hides the, the, the reality. I mean, we might be a soft power, but uh, that doesn't mean that people on the ground have power. And I think that's yeah, what we that's a soft power with a very large army. Is there a, another um, a question here on the front, on the right? Thank you for coming to Canada and speaking to all of us. Such a pleasure to meet you. Um, my question is, India is right now one of the fastest growing economies along China. And despite of the fact that we are having more jobs and the development is taking place, do you not think that that's going to help the poor or the low-income people to get more jobs? Does that not contribute to the economic and social conditions in India at this point in time? And my second question is, if you can please sh uh, shed some light on an event or a movement where all the human rights activists or most, most of the human rights activists got together and pushed an issue which actually became uh, you know, successful and people did get uh, success in pushing it forward. Thanks. Um, yeah, that, I mean, that's... Uh, very valid question when you look at, um, you know, the macro picture, of course, India's economy is growing, although in the last two years there's been a significant uh, slowdown and we in fact have a economic crisis uh, of our own which the government doesn't acknowledge, but if you look just at the level of price rise, the level of, you know, inflation, um, it's very, very high um, and difficult to, uh, to sustain. In fact, it's brought the very optimistic growth rate, uh, they were saying 8%, 10%, all that, they're not saying that anymore. Um, but but the, the, the question actually uh, relates to the point I was making about, uh, see the approach is a very neoliberal approach, right? So in spite of there being no evidence anywhere around the world that it has worked, it, there's still this belief amongst our policy makers uh, that there will be a trickle down right, or that a rising tide lifts all boats, and all this stuff that they keep saying. Um, but there's little evidence of that, because when you look, one very striking indicator, I don't have the exact figures, is that, is of income inequality. Um, in fact, this is something that's, I think, not been studied enough in Canada. There's some move towards that now. But that's a really good indicator of how the country is doing in terms of whether the economic wealth is spreading or not. And and whatever work has been done in India shows that, um, well, it's no surprise, the rich have become richer, the poor have become poor. Uh, we have, I don't know how many millionaires. Um, and, uh, and if you go to the Indian cities, you see the kind of, you know, I, I would consider obscene levels of development of, you know, five shopping malls in a row, you, have, you know, huge uh, infrastructure. And right next to that, we have, slums with thousands of people. Um, so so there is, there's, I don't think uh, that is uh, correct. And in fact, um, you know, India likes to project itself as a growing economic power. And one of the reasons they want to do that is because they want investment. But we have, you know, strange kinds of investment. We have something, some of you may have heard of a project called POSCO in Orissa. Uh, POSCO is a South Korean comp multinational company uh, that, you know, produces steel, and there's no benefit from that project for the local people, there's little benefit for the country actually, except for, you know, some reinvestment. And yet, so we're going in for these kinds of projects because we want to project ourselves as to the world, please come and invest in India. Um, but the, the, you know, either in places where sort of these mega investments are taking place, or nationally, um, that wealth, um, those resources are certainly not uh, getting to the poor. In fact, the poor are, as I was saying, are being displaced more and more. And was there a question in the back there? Uh, I'll yes, get you actually, next. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you very much. It was a very interesting uh, lecture. And that's actually a follow-up question to the one that we just had. Um, as you mentioned, in the sort of free market capitalist system that's now uh, prevail prevalent in India, when you have a, a growing disparity in wealth and the rich are getting grossly richer and the poor are staying stagnant or getting poorer, um, you are getting a lot of uh, super wealthy. And, and my question is, is, do you have a philanthropic class that's growing um, in, the, in the new super wealth? Are there super philanthropists in, in the Buffett vein or the Gates vein? And if that's not the case, if you don't see emergence of super philanthropists in this new era of super wealth, uh, do you have a rationale as to why? 
Well, you know, historically we've had um, some of our um, large uh, corporations, Indian corporations, which are now multinational as well, um, like the Tata Group, uh, uh, they've always had a very strong um, philanthropic arm where they've contributed. And ironically, the, the, the Tata Group, uh, through its education fund and so on, um, actually support human rights organizations, which is, you know, which is actually strange because many of their projects uh, violate human rights. But anyway, that's, that's fine. Um, and uh, of course, but, but we don't see the kind of what you term super philanthropic, uh, um, you know, people who are very, very rich. Um, I mean, we don't have anyone like uh, Bill Gates or, I mean, we, we don't have those types of people yet. And I think, you know, part of the reason is that there is, of course, a strong sort of voluntary sector in India. There's a lot of, there are a lot of people who give their time, um, you know, to help others. Uh, but but uh, there is a certain selfishness that is there right now. There's a certain thing of, you know, gaining profits and not putting it back into the country. So I think on a, on a sort of per capita basis, I would say there was a study done recently. Um, India, the, the, the wealth that is there nationally from people who are super rich is, is not really being, um, I mean, there are a few instances, but it's not, it's not a trend that they are um, contributing. There, there are instances, I mean, you may have heard this, sort of some Bollywood stars who, you know, give aid and all that, but it's, it's not at a level that, that you are speaking. It's not like a institutionalized uh, phenomenon, and that's actually quite disturbing. I mean, many of us, for example, for our work, uh, have to get funds from abroad, and it shouldn't be that way. I mean, there is enough wealth in the country that we should be able to raise funds domestically. So Mukesh Ambani isn't cutting you a check? No, I wouldn't take one from him, but... Uh, <laughs> okay. Now, um, you have a question on the front row? Um, actually, I wanted to ask, um, you mentioned several times that um, like people are being targeted or groups of like civil, people from the civil society, groups, yeah. society are get, getting targeted. Uh, I apologize because I'm not Indian and I don't know about, very much about Indian politics. It's just a question for me that who is targeting them? Is it the government or is it like local governments? Because on the other hand, you mentioned that you have a democratic um, society and then you are um, optimistic about the government. So I'm, I'm a little bit confused who is targeting uh, these groups. Uh, well, the, the, I mean, the large part of the you know, targeting uh, is, is, of course, done by police, it's done by, you know, government forces using whatever legislations exist or just, you know, intimidating people. But, but targeting is also done by um, individuals. I mean, we've had human rights defenders killed uh, by individuals who felt threatened that, for example, if someone is looking for a right to information, uh, you know, getting, trying to get information on land holdings of a particular landlord who owns a lot of land, um, um, is it possible to <laughs> lower there? Or, uh... It's actually that side. It's the far right, the one on the far right there, yeah. I, I love to see the sun in Vancouver, but this is a... Uh... <laughs> um, thanks. Uh, so, so, of course, there, is, there are private reprisals as well um, to try to stop that kind of uh, work. And... Uh, some very high-profile uh, human rights defenders have been assassinated, and we don't know who's done it. Um, so there are investigations going on. But uh, the point I was trying to make is that it, actually it's the role of the government and our Human Rights Commission and so on to protect defenders, right? I mean, if you are doing something where you are fighting for your legitimate rights, uh, there should be a form of protection. Um, and, and, you know, there's some discussion about... Uh, a bill actually to a law to to uh, for pro that type of protection but not much has happened there but in instead of doing that i mean our national human rights commission now has a, a 
sort of a desk that deals on human rights defenders and they take up cases and so on. But it's, uh, you know, they're not making much of a dent. But uh, the government should actually be, uh, particularly if people are using uh, national legislation to fight for their rights, uh, why should the government not protect them? Why should actually the police should be protecting them instead of harassing them? Yes, yes, exactly. But you know, you have to understand that in India we have, um, it, it's very um, schizophrenic almost, that you have arms of the government that are very helpful and you have others that are not. So, for example, you have some, some of our ministries will actually give you funds to critique what they're doing, right? I mean, that's democracy as well. You, uh, but then there are other parts of the same ministry who will you know, go after you or who will try to, you know, intimidate you. So, so it's a very, uh, it's a very confusing uh, situation and you have to sort of strike a balance and try to play, play those cards. But, but overall, um, uh, as far as human rights defenders are concerned, uh, the situation continues to get worse because, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of as rights violations increase, the number of defenders increase, and if you don't have a sort of legal framework in the country or a protective framework, then there will be reprisals. But uh, it's very, very disturbing that this is happening. It's happening a lot against, uh, we've had several cases recently of women who are fighting for their land rights in, in uh, Uttar Pradesh who were, you know, arrested uh, and no charges, just arrested. Um, so that's, uh, I think it's all comes down to a question of land, of resources, of some people not respecting democracy. And is there a question in the back? Here? Yes, sir. Yep. I just wanted to share a strange definition of human rights. Uh, 2009, we were attacked by terrorists from Pakistan, and one terrorist was caught, Ajmal Kasab. Yes, right. He continues to languish in Indian jail. Uh, the government spends about close to half a million dollars every month protecting him. The justices go slow. And the same government or the same setup doesn't even bat an eyelid to send in troops to Kashmir, to troops to Chhattisgarh, to troops to anywhere else. And uh, this, this is a really strange paradox, really, when we un try and understand what human rights are. There's been so many movements done in India to at least get this terrorist thing, Ajmal Kasab yes. thing, into limelight. And uh, why is this happening? So for a common man, uh, there is human rights for a foreigner, an alien on Indian soil, but there is hu no human rights for an Indian in our own soil. Well, you're right. I mean, that is a major contradiction. Uh, and, one of the, and the main reason is because the whole world is watching what happens with Kasab and whether, uh, you know, the rule of law or the process of justice uh, is followed as, as it should be for everyone, uh, even for convicted criminals, we, we cannot have a system where you know you handle things outside of the law. So, that, I mean, that's the reason. But you're absolutely right; that contradiction is there. Okay, we'll have two more questions. So, the gentleman here. Uh, um, could you rate the um, the media on how well they've informed about human rights in India? And I'm just thinking about two cases myself of uh, uh, Indrati Roy over the years, uh, right. years back, and then Vandana Shiva and how she's perceived there versus how she's perceived here. And then, and I don't know, my mom keeps talking about some gentleman named Amir Khan that keeps informing everybody. She says that he's the kind of information guy, but I don't know about that. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then the next one is, is, is there a place in a bioregion in India that you believe that's doing a better job in human rights than others? And I remember about 14 years ago, I went to a talk by Dr. Reese from UBC who talked about an ecological footprint, and he looked at Kerala as one of the models of the world. And I had went there about eight years ago, and I've only been there for 10 days, so it's hard to tell, but it was one of those places from the rest of India, even though it's highly densely populated, you were seeing some real progress in, like for my ancestors are from Punjab, you had six hectares of land, versus there you were seeing people that had one hectare of land and well, well distributed better healthcare system than, than the other parts, right. and food that was being distributed, and, and education. I don't know if that's changing, 
So that was my question, if, if that bioregion, if there is a bioregion that's better than others. Um, well, your first question about the media. Actually, the media has been, um, by and large, quite supportive. Um, we have very strong investigative journalism in India. Our newspapers are much better than yours. Um, um, I, I, you know, I mean, there's much more analysis. Uh, and when we go to the, uh, the, the major national newspapers, uh, they, they, they do cover human rights stories very regularly. Uh, this report, for example, has been extensively covered, and you know the media has have challenged the government uh, using those, uh, that data and those case studies. Um, and, and I actually didn't get your question about Arundhati and Vandana. W what was the point you were making? Right. Yeah, I, yeah. I heard Aaron Dutty was up on. They were talking about treason too. Is is that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, I think that's over now. But yeah, she was. Uh, the Supreme Court actually uh, took her on for what what she was saying. Um, and uh, but there hasn't been a similar thing with with Vandana. Uh, but it's true that you know. I mean, Vandana, perhaps to a certain lesser extent, but Arundhati certainly, um, I mean, how she's viewed abroad, um, I mean, for a lot of people, she, she seems to be the, you know, this great symbol of resistance and uh, whatever, everything done very poetically and in a literary manner. Um, but, but her credibility in India is not the same. Um, in fact, uh, Many of us feel that she's too shrill in her voice. Many of us feel that she's, uh, you know, constantly condemning and critiquing, and perhaps the state needs to be condemned and critiqued. But we all also feel that we should be constructive. We should offer solutions. Uh, we should try to have a dialogue uh, with the state. And so, I, I mean, there's a there is a difference in the way some people are viewed abroad and some are viewed at uh, at home. In terms of, uh, you know parts of India. Kerala certainly is, a, is an excellent example of how land reform was done, how wealth is distributed, uh, education, health, all of that. There's some sort of pictures that are appearing now because there's a lot of Gulf money pouring in. A lot of Keralites went to work in the Gulf. And there is some, you know, sort of inequity that's coming in between people who use that wealth to build fancy houses and things, and others who don't have access to that. But by and large, it remains a, a major success story. But it's very difficult to emulate uh, in different parts of the country because of the political and you know, other, other systems. There are many other parts of India where um, Bihar currently actually is, has some really rapid, rapid changes, things that we didn't expect, the way in which they've attacked uh, corruption, the way in which you know, the whole issue of... Uh, Dalit rights has been dealt with. I mean, Dalits generally in that state now feel, you know, because there's been a lot of political representation as well. Uh, so there, there's sort of good stories uh, all over the country. Uh, but the overall trends are not, not very encouraging. And the final question from the back row. Hi, thank you. Um, I have a quick question. So and listening to you talk about human rights and, and democracy in India, and I'm wondering if you have thoughts on this idea of imperial democracy that's starting to get developed, um, particularly in academic and international discourse. So this idea that you know, countries like Israel and India and the United States that we know as liberal democracies or representative democracies and who have all these kinds of standard hallmarks of freedom of the press and um, you know, representation in political democracy in elections, but increasingly engaging in policies of imperial democracy. So the kind of state warfare, the internal lack of um, human rights, um, you know, up, the upholding of human rights, the lack of economic progress, um, and that, you know, the, the extent to which neoliberalism is taking hold. And so, you know, I'm thinking particularly to the work of Chandra Mohanty and others who are increasingly classifying countries like India as imperial democracies um, to kind of capture the contradictions, if you will, of having a state that is politically democratic, but is fundamentally actually in many ways undemocratic. And I'm wondering if that is something or an idea that you engage with at all or what you think about that kind of classification. Um, 
I, I, I don't, I mean, I wouldn't entirely agree with that. I, I think there's a huge difference between, um, I mean, it's difficult to compare uh, India, Israel, and the U.S. I mean, we, we have, I mean, the kind of democracy that we have, um, it, it, that kind of a sort of, those kinds of democratic institutions, that level of civil society, the ability to, you know, get out there and protest uh, in so many different ways, um, the ability to use the courts, the public interest litigation. The, I mean, the, there's a range of the Right to Information Act I was referring to uh, is, is starkly different from uh, what is possible to do in Israel and the United States. Uh, I mean, where you may be right is that there is a sort of uh, reaching out to say that, okay, we are, we aspire to be a superpower, so, you know, don't mess with us. I mean, that's been one of the kind of bullying factors at the UN for many years, although that's, it, it's not there anymore in the last few years. But uh, that kind of an imperial, uh, but I, I would I would not um, classify India as that, and I would certainly not use the word imperial. Um, I think there are a lot of other forces in the country uh, that are managing, and, and you know, in spite of everything the government we, we can critique the government. There are a lot, of, a lot of, you know, sobering instances as well. We are not, we could have been far more neoliberal. Uh, we could have had far less regulated banks, for example. But we, there were always checks and balances, you know. Um, and there was always, there's always this huge issue of constituency. Because in India, I mean, the elections are, are a very vibrant form of expression. And governments can, can just fall. I think people have repeatedly... Um, thrown out governments that were not, uh, you know, not doing the right thing. So I think there is a, in that sense, the, the, the democracy works. And so I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily subscribe to that. Well, I want to thank you very much, Balloon. This has been highly enlightening. And one of the reasons why I, I enjoy the Indian Summer Festival, and congratulations to Laura Bespalco and, and Sarish Rao, who created and were the founders of, of the festival. And thank you very much, Am Johal of SFU, uh, for putting this on. The conversation will continue at, um, through W2. And uh, so if you want to carry on, you can. But, <laughs> but the live event in this room is about to end. And thanks, everyone, for coming. And I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Thanks very much.